It is now. Okay. I'll start over then. Good evening, everybody. Good to see you. I hope you have enjoyed this beautiful day. It has been very nice, although there, I guess there have been some storms that have kind of rolled through uh, some parts of Ohio, but we are thankful that we had some good weather here today. In fact, it was so nice today, I had a chance to go out and go for a little jog. It was nice. So good to see each of you. Um, is there anyone here that's, uh, anyone here for the first time tonight? Okay, welcome. Glad that you're here. At this time, um, we normally have a quiz. So does everyone have a quiz envelope? Okay. We'll have our three questions for our quiz, which will enable us to review our presentation from two nights ago. And remember to write your names on those envelopes because our ushers will collect those at the end of our quiz. And they will pull three names out of the basket and we'll give away some free gifts again tonight. All right, question number one. Question number one. In our last uh, meeting, we talked about why there are so many bad things that happen in the world, right? We talked about the devil. And the first question is a true or false question. True or false? According to the scriptures, the devil is responsible for the suffering that exists in our world today. True or false, the devil is responsible, according to scripture, the devil is responsible for the suffering that exists in our world today. Question number two, it's going to be fill in the blank, fill in the blank. In Luke chapter 10, verse 18, Jesus said that he beheld Satan, or he saw Satan, fall from, fall like lightning from, don't say the answer, just write it in. Fill in the blank. Jesus in Luke chapter 10, verse 18 said that he saw Satan fall like lightning from, fill in the blank. And then our last question, number three, in Ezekiel chapter 28, Ezekiel describes the devil as a beautiful, you fill in the blank. Ezekiel chapter 28 describes the devil as a beautiful, you fill in the blank. All right, question one, true or false? According to scripture, the devil is responsible for the suffering that exists in our world today. That's true, isn't it? Yeah, that's true. Uh, that might seem like a pretty elementary question, but the fact is that there are an awful lot of people in our world today who think God is the one who's responsible for the suffering that exists in our world. Uh, and uh, they believe that if God really did exist, uh, that he would do something to stop it. Tonight we're going to talk a little bit more about what God did do to help bring this sin and suffering to an end. We're going to focus on that tonight. But uh, uh, when people say that God is the one that's responsible, um, it's a misunderstanding, isn't it? The scriptures are very clear. The devil is the one. And, and, and incidentally, if you want to read an interesting passage of scripture that highlights this, it's Matthew chapter 13. In Matthew chapter 13, Jesus tells a parable. And it makes it very clear in that parable who's responsible for the suffering. Okay, question number two. According to Luke chapter 10, verse 18, Jesus said that he saw Satan fall like lightning from, from heaven. That's right. The devil is not some hideous monster with horns and hooves and red suit and pitchfork uh, living down in the center of the earth somewhere as he is often depicted living in some pit of molten lava where he's got a pitchfork and he's, you know, torturing uh, lost souls. Uh, the scriptures, in fact, teach that Lucifer did not originate in a pit in the center of the earth, but he originated in heaven of all places. And remember, we talked about that war that broke out in heaven between uh, the devil and his angels and Michael and his angels, and the devil was then cast down to this earth, and that's how he ended up here in, on planet earth. Our last question, number three, 
Ezekiel chapter 28 describes the devil as a beautiful, a beautiful angel, yeah, a beautiful angel, beautiful and intelligent. And that was, well, that was what led to his fall. He became filled with, with pride and with arrogance because of his beauty and because of his wisdom. And he became jealous of God and jealous of Jesus. And he wanted to knock God off his throne and he wanted to take God's throne. Okay, very good. I'd like to invite you now to pass your envelopes quickly to the aisles. Our ushers are going to collect those, they're going to bring them up front, and we're going to have our drawing. And tonight, we're going to give away the book In the Presence of Angels. Very nice book, a collection of inspiring true angel stories. Whoever wins these books will enjoy them very much. And also, because our topic tonight is what happened at the cross, Bob, we've got a few more of your crosses that you make. These are the uh, authentic uh, olive wood crosses, uh, authentic olive wood from Bethlehem, the Bethlehem where Jesus was born. And uh, we'll give these away tonight as well. Okay, you ready? Let's have two more, two more ushers come up near the front. Okay, this one doesn't have a name on it. Boy, I think, I think you won uh, already, Carol Krause. Wow, this, here, let's give this book and this cross to, to Carol tonight. You're doing well, Carol, that's two nights now. All right, uh, William Van Nest, right here, all right. And our next winner tonight is Dylan Zimmerman. Okay. There you go. Right here. Right there. Thank you very much. I wanted to let you know also um, tonight I have a, well, you're obviously you're going to get your study guide and on the way out. You want to make sure you pick up your study guide, how to find personal peace, peace in today's world. Um, but also, I have a little book called Steps to Jesus. Now, I know that a lot of you that are in this in meeting here tonight already have this book. And I don't have enough for everyone, but I do have enough at least for our guests. And, but even if, you're, if, even if you have this book already, feel free, to, you can take one. But I would ask that you would take it in order, if you already have it, okay? Just take it to share it with someone else, Okay. But if you're a visitor, you'll have first dibs on these books. They're out there that when, the, when the greeters hand you the study guide. If you want one of these books, just let them know, and they'll make sure that you get one of these, okay? Steps to Jesus. I also want to remind you that uh, tomorrow night, Thursday night, we will not have a meeting. It's Thursday night, so we take that night off, and then we'll be back on Friday. And our subject on Friday, the title of our subject is Rescue. And we're going to be focusing on the second coming of Jesus. Now, a few nights ago, we talked about the signs of the times, which was dealing with the timing of Christ's coming. And remember, we said that no one really knows the day or the hour of his coming. But we do know from the signs uh, that we're getting closer, aren't we? But on Friday night, when we talk about the second coming, we're going to look at it from a little bit of a different angle. Instead of the timing, we're going to talk about the manner of Christ's coming. You know, it's, it's very interesting. When you look at biblical truth, you learn very quickly that for every truth that God has, the devil has a counterfeit, doesn't he? For every truth that God has, the devil has a counterfeit. And even amongst Christianity, there are differing views about how Jesus is going to come back again, right? I see some of you shaking your heads, and you've heard some of these different ideas, right? Well, we're going to open God's Word on Friday night like we do every night in these meetings, and we're, gonna, we're not going to be looking at books that are written, you know, popular books about the, about the second coming of Jesus. We're going to be looking at the Word of God, amen? Because uh, that's, that should be our rule of faith and practice. That's where we want to find out the truth of, uh, th th as it relates to the second coming of Jesus. Um, and uh, it's very important that we understand this 
because as we learned uh, in a, a few nights ago, there will be many false Christs and many false prophets at the end of time. And some people are, have been and will be deceived by individuals who claim that they're Jesus. And the secret to not being deceived when it comes to these false Christs is knowing how Jesus will come. If you know how Jesus will come, there shouldn't be any reason at all that you would ever be deceived by these individuals who claim to be um, Jesus. Pastor Michael, would you come up and have a prayer for us tonight before we begin? Yes. I'd like to read, going into prayer, Luke 8 and verse, verse 24. This is Jesus on a boat, and, and uh, the disciples are saying, Master, Master, we're going to drown. That's how life feels sometimes. Jesus got up and he rebuked the wind and the raging waters and the storm subsided and all was calm. And they with fear and amazement asked, who is this that commands even the winds and water and they obey him? So Father, as the God of the universe, the one over the winds and the waves, tonight we pray that you would speak peace into our hearts and that you would trouble the storms that are raging in our families are raging in our workplaces, in our schools, or in our world even. Lord, let it be tonight that all would be calm and still, and you would speak to our hearts. That master, Master, we are drowning, but would you stand up tonight and speak to us through your word? In the name of Jesus, amen. Amen. Thank you. Our topic tonight is entitled, What Happened at the Cross? What happened there 2,000 years ago at that cross of Calvary where this man called Jesus of Nazareth was crucified? What is its significance for us today and why has it, why has it meant so much to people down through the centuries? Why does this, this cross have such magnetic there's like a magnetic force to it that draws people to it for some reason. We're going to talk a little bit about that tonight. And once again, we're going to turn to the Word of God. If it's in the Bible, I believe it. We're not interested in looking at men's opinions. I'm not interested in sharing my opinions with you tonight. I'm interested in sharing with you from the Word of God. Because that is our only trustworthy source as we're seeking for truth in these last days. Amen? So let's go to the Bible, but before we actually get into Scripture, there is a little story by way of introduction that I'd like to share with you. Many years ago, there was a ship that was caught in a, a violent storm, and that ship broke into pieces. And tragically, every, all of the crew members were lost, with the exception of one crew member. And when the storm subsided, he found himself clinging desperately to a a piece of the wreckage. And uh, after some time went by, after some hours passed by, of course, as you can imagine, he was starting to feel desperation, wondering if, if anyone would know that he was out there or if he would ever uh, live, live to see his family again. And despair began to creep into his heart and to his mind. And, and then suddenly, as he looked off into the horizon, he saw something. He saw a cross. He wasn't sure at first what it was. He just saw something in an object, and, and he instinctively, as anyone would that's out there in the ocean, right, you, you start swimming towards it. He started swimming as, as, as fast as he could towards this, this object. And the closer he got to it, he realized that, in fact, it was a cross. There was a, a little church there on this little area, this little island or this shoreline, and he saw the cross and he fixed his eye on that cross and he started swimming and swimming and swimming. And because he kept his eyes fixed on that cross, it gave him hope, it gave him courage and it led him safely to the shore and that cross saved that man's life in a sense. You know, you and I are floating around obviously out in the ocean. But in a way, we are floating around in an ocean of sin, aren't we? 
We live in a world that's filled with sin and confusion and sickness and death. And very much like that young man in the story, there is a desperation that has gripped the hearts of many human beings. There are many people today who are, who are journeying through life and their hearts are, are filled with hopelessness and despair. And what we need, like this young man here, we need to see the cross, don't we? And if we'll keep our eyes fixed on that cross, just like that cross led him to safety, the cross of Christ will lead us safely home as well. For millions around the world tonight, this is true. There are many people down through the centuries and, and into our time here tonight who have looked to this cross and they have found hope, not only because the cross has led them to uh, eternal life, but the cross has also led them to have a more abundant and happier, more enriching, fulfilled life here on earth while they await the return of Christ. Christ. Well, throughout history and, and, and even again today, tonight, there are various objects which are used as symbols of faith. Uh, in the, uh, the Muslim faith or the Islam, of Islam, you have the crescent moon and you have the star. And then for the Jewish people, of course, you have the star of David. And for the Christian, we have the cross. It's very interesting, when you look at the cross, of course, we know that back in ancient times, the cross was an instrument of execution. It was an instrument of torture. And so knowing that, you, maybe you may wonder, why would the cross be a symbol of faith for Christians? We know that throughout uh, the ancient world, there were many people that were crucified on crosses. As a matter of fact, if you studied anything about the fall of Jerusalem in 70 AD, 39, 40 years after Christ was crucified, buried, rose, and ascended to heaven, in 70 AD, the, the uh, Jewish historian Josephus tells us that when the Romans, uh, when they destroyed Jerusalem, they crucified so many of the Jewish people that you could hardly walk down the road without passing through the shadow of a cross where a Jewish person was hanging and dying. It was a dreadful way to die, too. Uh, people would hang on these crosses sometimes for several days. And the birds would come and would, would peck at them and peck at, I don't want to go into all the detail. It was just a, it was a horrific way to die. And eventually, they would not be able to hold themselves up and they would basically would suffocate to death. They couldn't breathe anymore. And yet today in our world, this instrument of torture is used as a symbol of our faith. Think about it. It seems kind of ironic in a way, doesn't it? I mean, crosses are everywhere. We find them uh, on top of churches. We find them on the walls of buildings. We find them in uh, some people have crosses that they wear as necklaces, and some people wear crosses as earrings. And, and you know, today we don't, uh, we don't hear of too many people being crucified. There are other ways... Uh, that people are put to death, their electric chairs, or uh, they inject them, you know, with some drug that causes them to go to sleep and die. You'd never see a person, I don't think, maybe, I don't think you'd ever see someone walking around with a, a chain with an electric chair hanging around their neck or, or, a, a, or some kind of a syringe, you know, in their ear. Maybe some people would. But yet you'll see crosses in ears and, and hanging around. An instrument of torture, it seems a bit odd. Well, I mean, what is it about this cross? What is it, this, this symbol that brings so much hope uh, to the world tonight? Well, obviously, we know the answer to that, don't we? Uh, we know that the cross brings hope to us tonight because it is on this cross that Jesus Christ died and paid the penalty for our transgressions, right? It's on the cross where Jesus hung and died and gave his life so that you and I could be forgiven for our sins. It's on the cross where Jesus died so that you and I could have power to have victory over sin in our lives. You know, the cross, the cross doesn't only offer forgiveness. It also offers power for victory. Isn't that good news? I mean, what, what good would a religion be? 
What good would Christianity be if it offered forgiveness, but it never really offered us any power to overcome the, these habits, that, these life-destroying habits that ruin our lives? The cross is powerful. It's powerful. And this is why it has become such a symbol of hope, a symbol of faith. Well, let's talk a little bit about Jesus. Who was Jesus anyway? There again are a lot of different ideas about who Jesus was. You know, there are a lot of people who do not deny the existence of Jesus. They don't deny the fact that he died on a cross. There are many uh, people, and even in other religions, who believe that Jesus was a good man. He was a good moral teacher. And if people, if the majority of people in this world would follow his teachings, the world would be a better place to live in. But they don't believe beyond that, that he was anything more than just a good man or a good moral teacher. But what does the Bible teach? There is something about him. You know, I mean, it's one thing Jesus died on the cross, okay. But a lot of people died on the cross. What's different about him? Of course, we know the story around Christmas time, we celebrate the birth of Jesus and his coming into this world. What does it all mean? Well, let's go back. 2,000 years ago when Jesus began his ministry, as he preached and as he healed people and as he shared the message of God's hope, there were people that were attracted to him. And there were people that were helped by him and people that found hope. He brought hope to the hopeless. He brought light where there was darkness. He brought healing where there was sickness and death. He brought truth where there was error and confusion. Jesus attracted people. They were attracted to him because of, of this, this message of hope that he had. And they started to gather around him and they started to follow him. Most, uh, most theologians believe that Jesus was around 30 years old or so, maybe in his late 20s or so, when he began his, uh, his ministry. He hadn't trained in the schools of the rabbis, but he was ordained by God. He was anointed by the Holy Spirit at his baptism, and he began to preach, and he began to teach. And by all accounts, his ministry lasted for about three and a half years. He was a young man. Remember our very first night we talked about this? We talked about Alexander the Great, right? Alexander the Great was a young man, very charismatic, very courageous, very powerful in battle. And yet he died as a young man. He was able to conquer other nations, but he couldn't conquer his own weaknesses. He, he had died of a drunken, over, uh, uh, an alcoholic overdose complicated by some type of a fever. Alexander the Great could conquer other nations. He couldn't conquer himself. But Jesus, Jesus conquers not with a sword. Jesus conquers with truth and with love. And he conquers our hearts. He wins our hearts. And he shows us the way to conquer sin in our lives. There's something about this man called Jesus. Three and a half years, he'd pass through some villages where there was sickness and he would leave and the people would flock and when he would leave, not one person would be sick. People that, uh, we have accounts in the Bible, where obviously, where people had died and Jesus simply called them to, to wake up or he touched them and they would rise to, to new life again. There were those who were blind and Christ would touch their eyes and, and the very first thing they had ever seen in their lives was the face of Christ people that were deaf, people that couldn't speak, people that were crippled and, and physically impaired, and Jesus would touch them and he'd speak words of hope and he would heal them. People that felt desperately lost because of their sins, they felt hopeless and in despair, Christ would speak words of hope and peace and assurance of God's love to them. No wonder why people love this man called Christ. Who wouldn't? Well, there were some that did not. There were some that did not like him. It was the religious leaders, of course, right? Many of the religious leaders hated Jesus because they were losing their influence upon the people. As the people were being drawn to Jesus, they were losing their control of the people. And they, they, they told themselves, we've got to do something to stop this man. And so you know the story. They went to Pontius Pilate, and they were able to persuade him to hand Jesus over to be put to death. Jesus was put to death. But again... When we think of the cross and we think of Jesus being crucified, we realize that scores and scores of people were crucified. What made the difference? Why did the crucifixion of Jesus impact people the way that it did as opposed to all the other hundreds or thousands who were crucified? Well, let's go on. 
Jesus, of course, was more than just an ordinary man. Jesus was more than just a good teacher. Jesus was more than just a good prophet. But Jesus claimed to be God on earth. Remember, he said before Abraham was, I am. That's the same name that when Moses was called by God to go to Pharaoh and tell Pharaoh to let the children of Israel go after being in Egyptian bondage for 400 plus years. And Moses said to God, but when I go and, and I appear before him and the people, the people ask me, your people ask me, well, who are you to lead us? And God said, tell them the great I am has sent you. And so when Jesus, many years later, when Jesus said, before Abraham was, I am, he was using the same name that, that God told Moses to use when re in reference to God. Jesus claimed to be God. Now, either he was who he claimed to be, or he's a liar. And the re when he said those words, if you read the account in the scriptures, the people around him picked up stones and they wanted to kill him. You know why? Because in the Bible, one of the definitions of blasphemy is when a human being claims to be God. So Jesus claimed to be God, more than just a man, but he was the divine son of God sent to this earth in order to rescue us. Notice what it says here. In the beginning, this is John chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was what? Let me say it, let's, let me read it again. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. The Bible tells us the Word became flesh and dwelt among men. That's talking about Jesus. Jesus was the Word, and the Word was God. Therefore, Jesus is God. And, it, and now notice what it says here. All things were made through Him. Through who? Through him, this is talking about Jesus, okay? All things were made through Jesus, and without him, nothing was made that was made. God worked through Jesus to create the world. Jesus, we often say, was the active agent in creation. God worked through Jesus to create this magnificent world. Uh, I, I, you know, you won't read this. What I'm about to share with you right now is not in the Bible, okay? But it's, it's something that helps me to kind of sort of wrap my mind around something that you really have to accept by faith. How did God create the world through Jesus? How is it that Jesus is the active agent in creation? Well, you know, for those of you that are builders, you know that if you have a, an architect, right? You have an architect who draws up plans for a building, and then you have, uh, you have contractors who put out bids, and then the contractors then hire people to build the building. They hire the electricians and the carpenters and the plumbers and all of that, right? So in, in essence, the architect is building through all these other people, see? And God, the master designer of our world and our universe, he's the architect. Again, I'm just, don't, don't take this as gospel. I'm just this just helps me. God is, the, God is the architect, if you will. The Holy Spirit is the contractor, and Jesus is the carpenter. And he is a carpenter, right? He was a carpenter. God, when the Bible talks about God creating through Christ, I kind of that's how I picture it in my mind. But Jesus was the active agent. Now, this is significant, and this is important. This is what sets Jesus apart from all these other people that died on crosses back then, the thousands that were put to death. Jesus was more than just a, a man. He is God. He is the divine son of God. He is, he is God, the great I am, but he's also the creator. Think about this for just a moment. The creator of mankind allowed his own creation to put him to death. It's almost mind-boggling when you think about it, isn't it? It is amazing. But Jesus is the great creator. Jesus created this beautiful world. You know, this is a wonderful time of year, isn't it? The grass is so, it's turning so bright and green. The tulips and the daffodils and the trees are budding and, and you see all the beautiful flowers and, and the, the, the beautiful fragrances that are in the air. 
and you, you hear the birds, you know, uh, when winter ends, you suddenly hear all these birds chirping and, and you know, and pretty soon you're going to see little baby goslings walking around, you know, and you're going to see little baby robins and baby cardinals, all these little birds and different animals. It's a, it's a sort of a, it's like the earth comes back to life after the, the deep sleep of winter. And when you see all of these beautiful things and you hear these beautiful sounds, where do you think they came from? Some people would want you to say, to believe that this, this all just happened by some accident. That you're nothing more than a, a, a speck of dust that blew out of a cosmic big bang in heaven. Or you're nothing more than just a, 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 an amoeba that crawled out of the sea billions and billions of years ago and evolved into a human being. But the scriptures teach us something different. The scriptures teach us that this world, including every last one of us here tonight, was created by God, by Jesus, the great creator. So, you know, when you're out, uh, someone once said, you know, the Bible, it, our nature is God's second Bible. His fingerprints and footprints are all over the, the world. It, Paul said, the invisible things of God are clearly seen by the things that he has made so that we humans are without excuse. There's no excuse for not believing in God when you look at nature. God is, all of nature testifies. It shouts out from the mountaintops. There is a God. He created you. He loves you. He has a purpose for your life. He has a destiny for you to fulfill. Your life is more than just living here on earth. You have an eternity that waits. It lies out there before you. And as the ceaseless ages of eternity roll on, you can be a part of it if you accept Christ. Let's go on. The book of Hebrews, the, the, the writer of Hebrews, uh, many believe it was Paul. He said, God who at various times and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets. Has in these last days spoken to us by his son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the worlds. You know, he created this world. And all the planets, you know, scientists tell us now that we haven't even scratched the tip of this iceberg when it comes to, you know, space and, and all these galaxies and all this those are out there. I mean, we, we, we've seen a lot through the Hubble telescope and all those different things, but we haven't seen anything. God, Jesus created all of this for us and for our enjoyment. It's amazing, isn't it? It's truly wonderful. Colossians also written by Paul, for by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things and in him all things consist. Jesus existed in heaven with the Father before he was born as a baby in Bethlehem. Do you believe that tonight? That's what the Bible says. He is the preexistent God. He lived in heaven before coming to this earth. Again, just think about this. The God of the universe, Jesus, through the, through the work of the Holy Spirit, placed in the womb of this young woman, Mary. You know the story, Mary and Joseph. You read about Jesus' lineage there in Matthew chapter 1, and Jacob begot Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who is called the Christ. Remember the angel when Mary said to Joseph that she was going to have a baby and uh, he wanted to sort of set her aside, the angel came to him and said, no, 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 no. This thing has been done by the Holy Spirit. This child is going to be the Savior. His name is to be called Jesus, for he shall save men from their sins. More than just a man, more than just a good teacher. This man is the Son of God. The angel answered and said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore also that Holy One who is to be born will be called the Son of God. This was a miracle. A virgin, a young woman, Mary, a virgin, gives birth to Jesus, the creator of the universe. The creator of the universe descends into the womb of a young woman. Imagine, it boggles the mind. And yet, this is what scripture teaches. Jesus is the link between earth and heaven. He's called the son of man because he became a human being. 
He's called the Son of God because he is the divine one. And with his, in his humanity, he takes hold of humanity. And as in his divinity, he takes hold of God. And for every hand that reaches up, Christ will connect us back with God. Can you say amen to that? He's the link that can never be broken. Christ is a link between you and heaven, between you and the Father that can never, ever be broken except by one thing, human choice. Human choice. If you want to be reunited with God again, if you want to live as Adam and Eve did in the Garden of Eden with face-to-face -face communion with God, if you want to live once again in a perfect world where there's no more sin or suffering, let Christ take your hand and connect you back to God. What was Jesus really like? Philippians chapter 2, verse 5 through 8. Let this mind be in you, Paul writes. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. In other words, Jesus was equal to God, but he didn't, he didn't consider this equality with God something that he had to grasp on and hold on to. He was willing to let that go in order to come down to this earth in order to save you and me. He made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. Christ came down to this earth and he faced the, same, he faced the trials and temptations of this world just like you and I must. And that's why the Bible says he's a faithful high priest now who can sympathize with the struggles that we've gone through. Jesus faced trials. He got hungry like you and me and thirsty like you and me. He felt joy like us. He felt sadness like us. He faced death like us. He lost loved ones like us. He came to this earth and pitched his tent. I like the way one of my favorite authors in the book, Desire of Ages, one of the greatest books ever written on the life of Christ, and the author says that Jesus, when he came down to this earth, he pitched his tent next to humanity, and he lived with us. For 30, 33, 34 years, he walked among mankind. He understands. If you, you, you ever feel like, oh, how, you know, God could never understand, Jesus could never understand, no one understands the trials I go through. No one understands the burdens I bear, the pain in my life, and... Jesus understands there may not be another human being that understands. I'll give you that. There may not be another ear that you dare to whisper in, into, no other human ear that you dare whisper in the things that you struggle with. But there is a God who loves you and cares for you, Jesus Christ, your high priest, who has gone through the trials of this life and who's willing to help you. Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 8, and being found in appearance as a man, Jesus, he, Jesus, humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Jesus became a human just like us. It's amazing. It's absolutely amazing. Well, here's that, that famous text. We all know this one by heart. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. I want you to notice something about this text right here. It doesn't say that God loves us because Jesus died for us. It was his love that sent Jesus to die in the first place. It was his love for us, this wayward planet, this rebellious planet. It was his love, his desperate love for us that caused the God of the universe to send his son to come to this world and to perish on a cross so that you and I could be rescued from this thing called sin and death. Someday Christ is going to come again. We're not stranded here. We're not left as orphans in this world. Sometimes you look around the world and evil seems to have the upper hand. And sometimes people whose minds are filled with doubt and skepticism will try to convince you that there is no God. God doesn't care. God does. But my Bible says something else. My Bible says that there is a God, Jesus Christ, who came as a human being. He, did, he hasn't abandoned us. He will never abandon us. He says, lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. He identifies with your struggles. He identifies with your joys, your sorrows. The same Jesus that walked the dusty streets of Palestine, the same Jesus that brought hope and healing to the people of that time is the same Jesus that lives and reigns today and who delights in offering hope to his people here on earth today. He's still alive and well. He's still available to anyone who wants to cry out and ask. In the Psalms, God says, call upon me and I will answer thee and I will deliver you and you will glorify my name. 
Call upon me and I will answer you and show you great and mighty things which you do not know. Just call upon him. Trust him. Believe. I am with you always. Matthew 28, 20. I will never leave you nor forsake you under any circumstances. That's one of my favorite passages. I remember when I first became a Christian 40 years ago, that passage right there stood out in my mind. I will never leave you. He told me, God said, Bill, I will never leave you nor forsake you. And I have to tell you, after 40 years, he has kept his promise. And in Isaiah 43, verse 4, I have loved you. I have loved you with an everlasting love. Yes, come to the cross. What happened at the cross? The Son of God became a man. He was born to die. Born to die for you and for me. What does it all mean? Well, we live in a world that has gone mad, a world that has gone wrong. It's a, a, a world that's gone off the rails. Now, I don't mean to be silly when I ask you this question, but have you ever done anything wrong? Of course. I've done lots of things wrong, things I'm ashamed of, things I'm embarrassed, things I would never want anyone to know. We've all had things like that in our lives. It's called sin. Sometimes we sin and we scratch our heads after we do something or say something and we think, what was I thinking? Why did I, why did I do that? But we live in a world where, you know, things have gone bad. But it says here that the eyes of the Lord are in every place, keeping watch on the evil and the good. God sees everything. Yes, he sees the bad. He knows we can't hide. We may be able to hide things that we do in our life from others, but we can't hide them from God. But God doesn't only see the evil. He sees the good as well. God sees everything. He knows everything about your life, and he loves you. Ecclesiastes 12, verse 14, God will bring every work into judgment, including every secret thing, whether it is good or evil. And because we live in a world that's filled with evil, there are many people who shake their fist at God, they're angry with God, and they shake their fist, and they turn from God, and they enter into a life of rebellion. And this is the whole crux of, of the matter. In, when it comes to sin, it's, it's, it's either we're going to serve God or we're going to serve self. Either we're going to choose God as the authority in our lives and his word, or we're going to place ourself as our authority. Either we're going to give our allegiance and our loyalty to self, or we're going to give our loyalty and our allegiance to God. And I said two nights ago, and I want to say it again, and I'll probably say it many times in the next six or seven nights that we have together. In this great battle between good and evil, loyalty and allegiance is going to be front and center. It's going to come right to the top. Who will you give your allegiance to in this great battle between good and evil? Who are you going to give your loyalty to? That's what it really comes down to. Who will you render obedience to? You know, Paul talks about obedience, right? We obey Jesus, we're free. But when we, when we, uh, when we obey sin, we become slaves to sin, right? Our tendency our, in our sinful, fallen human nature, every last one of us, our tendency is to reject the authority of God and do it our way. That's just the way, it's the way we, we are because of our fallen natures. And sometimes we feel like, we feel hopeless. We feel like, I, I want to do good. I, I, I pray and I try to do good, but I just can't seem to, listen, don't give up. Remember, the cross provides power and victory too. Christ, don't give up on yourself. Christ isn't going to give up on you. Sometimes Christ will take us over the same path again and again until we gain the victory because he loves us. We've done wrong, and because we've done wrong, the wages of sin that hangs over our head is death. But we have a choice to make, just like the young man in this picture. Who will you serve? Who will be your master? Will it be Jesus, or will it be self? Will it be Jesus, the divine Son of God, or will it be the enemy of your souls, the devil? We're destined to die because we have sinned, but there is hope for life through Christ. Back in the Garden of Eden, there was Eve. We talked quite a bit about this uh, last night. God told Adam and Eve, you could have anything you want in this beautiful garden, 
Everything that, that you need for your happiness, your well-being, your health, your peace, your joy, I've provided for you. But there's one thing that you are not to do. You are not to partake of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. It was a test of loyalty. There's that word again, loyalty. It was a test of loyalty. Who would they give their loyalty to? That was the question. And, of course, we know what happened. It says here, when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of the fruit and she did eat and she gave it to her husband and he did eat. Now, I want to share something and this will probably make all the women here happy tonight. Do you know God does not blame Eve for the mess that we're in? He blames Adam. Well, if you look in the book of Romans, you look in the New Testament, Corinthians, it doesn't say anything about Eve. It doesn't say that death entered into the world through one woman named Eve. It says it entered into the world through a man called Adam. And through, though death came in through Adam, life will come in through the second Adam, right? Here's why I believe that's true. Eve was deceived, but Adam chose. There's a little difference there. In the end, at the end of the day, they both opened the door. But another mistake that Eve made was this. She wandered away, and she went over by the tree by herself alone. She went and she stood there and she looked at the tree. And we do the same thing. We, we, we wander away from safety and we, we look at something that tempts us. And, we, and, and what we should do, what she should have done is she should have immediately turned and ran away. But she stood there and she kept looking at it. And the more she looked at it, the more beautiful it became in her eyes. And the more, uh, and then came the serpent, right, to talk to her. And it overwhelmed her senses. And we do the same thing. We, we sort of toy around with temptation. We, we look at something. We know it's wrong, but we, we look at it and we kind of, well, maybe, I mean, maybe I could, maybe just this one time. And, and what happens? We fall into it, and sometimes we get drugged down the road until we're trapped into it. Well, for 6,000 years now since this occurred, we are still reaping the consequences of her choice and Adam's choice. Sickness, war, disease, death. The scriptures are clear. Therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world, and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men because all have sinned. Yes, all have sinned. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Last night, I or two nights ago, I talked about this great chasm of sin that separates us from God. When Jesus laid down his life on the cross, that cross is a bridge that covers that chasm and makes a way for us to come back to Jesus. You know, most people, most people don't consciously choose to serve the devil. You know what I mean? I mean, if the devil came up you know, uh, and said, follow me. Most people would, would not, you know. But what happens is we make decisions and we make choices and we follow our own opinions and we, 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 we do what feels good and we end up getting ourselves into trouble. We have to live. We have to choose to live by the word of God and not allow our feelings and emotions and all these things to control us. But the only way that we can overcome all of that is through Christ. Through Christ and through his word. The Bible says you shall have no other gods before me. That's what God commands us in the Ten Commandments. And yet that's what Adam and Eve did. And that's what we as human beings do. What Adam and Eve essentially did was they gave their allegiance, which was supposed to be to God. They gave their allegiance over to the devil. He became their God. And so it led to the problems that we have today. But notice God came to the rescue. I talked about this two nights ago too. God, when Adam and Eve sinned, God came in pursuit of them. He unfolded the plan of redemption right there in the garden while they were hiding in shame in the bushes. And John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him, that whosoever is you, it's me, whoever believes in him. Salvation is not just for a select few. It's not just for some little, you know, it's not just for white people. It's not just for black people. It's not just for men. It's not just for women. It's not just for the old or the young or the educated or the uneducated, the illiterate or the literate. 
Salvation is for everyone. Whosoever will. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. All of us have rebelled, but there is hope. In Romans chapter 8, verse 1, if you confess your sins, if you repent of your sins and give your life to Christ, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. The devil wants to come along and steal away your joy, and he wants to remind you of your past and of your sin. And someone once said, when the devil comes and reminds you of your past, remind him of his future. You like that one, Lou? Yeah. When the devil reminds you of your past, remind him of his future. No condemnation. Don't you like that? Once you accept Christ and you confess your sins, you are no longer condemned by a broken law. Jesus paid the penalty for your sins on the cross. He was the one that was condemned for your sins and mine. He suffered the condemnation. You don't have to lay on your bed at night with your stomach twisted in knots, staring up into the darkness with feelings of despair and hopelessness, wondering if you could ever be accepted by God, if you could ever be good enough. All you have to do is believe, accept the promise, and it is yours. Don't let the devil steal away your joy. Christ paid the penalty for you. You don't need to go on some uh, pilgrimage where you beat your body and punish yourself. And, you know, uh, Martin Luther, the great reformer, did that. And then he discovered righteousness by faith, and he was set free. And so we can be as well. Scores and scores of people are filled with hopelessness and feel condemnation today. But I want to say to you on the authority of God's word that if you come to Jesus Christ, your condemnation will be swept away and you can be set free forever through Christ. No condemnation. You know, there are many people that sit in prisons today because of their sins. But some people sit, the prison bars are worse than iron and steel. It's the prison of their minds, the prison of their hearts. They're filled with guilt and remorse and regret. But Christ can unlock that prison house and set you free if you'll just simply trust in him. Jesus died in your place. All we like sheep have gone astray. So before we look at other people, you know, and start, you know, judging other people, let's remember to start with ourselves. Each of us has sinned. Every last one of us, like a sheep, has gone astray. We've turned everyone to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him, that is, on Jesus, the iniquity of us all. When Jesus died, he was called the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. This plan of redemption was not something, this, the sin of mankind was not something that caught uh, God off guard. The plan of redemption was from the foundations of the world, and Jesus is referred to as this Lamb of God who was sacrificed for our sins. God demonstrates his love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. We don't have to clean up our act. You know, there are a lot of people who say, you know, I, I, I invite, invite them to a meeting like this or invite them to come to my church, and they'll say, well, they'll say things like, man, if, if I walked into that church, the earth would probably open up and swallow us. You know, I'm just not, well, I was listening to a, a preacher uh, just today, actually. He was telling a story. He was, uh, he was having a, a, a lecture like this, and there was a woman there, and, and he asked her, uh, if she would uh, be interested in getting baptized and joining the church. And she kind of shook her head and he said, why not? She said, because I'm just not good enough. But see, this is what a lot of people think. They think they have to clean up their act. They have to straighten things out. Well, I need to, I need to stop smoking and swearing. And you know, I need to really, before I can come to God, I just need to, you know, listen, the Bible doesn't say God demonstrated his love toward us after we cleaned up our acts. It says God demonstrates his love, his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Don't you like that? There's hope tonight through Christ. This means that no matter what you've done, if you've lied, you've stolen, you, you, listen, you could, there could be someone sitting, I was in one meeting one time, and there, you know, there are people that, all kinds of people that come to meetings like this. People, now listen to me, there are people that come to these meetings that are adulterous. They come to these meetings and they're looking for answers and they're in, a, they're in unholy uh, uh, relationships. There are people that come to these meetings, I'm telling you from experience, that are murderers, okay? 
I'm not, I'm not saying that for uh, effect or anything like that. It's true. There are people that come to these meetings that are thieves. There are people that are abusers and predators. They, but listen, whatever you've done, and I, I'm not, you, well, we're not asking you to come here and, and give us confessions. That's between you and God. But whatever you've done in your life, you just take it to the Lord. And he says, come now, let us reason together. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. He shows this great contrast, doesn't he? This could be the deepest, darkest sin, but Jesus says, look, if you'll come to me, I'll make you white as snow. This is good news. You may be a thief. You may be a liar. You may be unfaithful, but I want you to know tonight there's hope. There's hope through Christ. If you feel uh, lost tonight, if you feel guilty and ashamed, I want you to know there's hope through Christ. It's no accident that you came to these meetings. I don't know if you got a, uh, an invitation in the mail. I don't know if someone uh, invited you to come to these meetings, but there's, it's no accident that you're here. You are here tonight by divine appointment. It is part of God's divine plan to rescue you and deliver you from sin and death. Take advantage of that now. No more condemnation. Jesus paid the penalty for you. Hebrews chapter 8, verse 12, for I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins. Mercy. You know, some people, some people, you know, they, they won't be merciful. There are some people in this world who will never be merciful. If they find out that you've done something wrong, they will not be merciful. But God is merciful. I will be merciful to their unrighteousness, he says, and their sins and their lawless deeds. I, now listen to this. Isn't this wonderful? I will remember them no more. It's like you go to God and, you know, you, you committed this sin, you ask for forgiveness for it, and then later on, you know, as it sometimes happens, you know, maybe a, a, a week later or a month later, maybe even a year later, it starts, you remember, oh, I did this, I know I confessed it, but Lord, could you please, please forgive me for this? And the Lord says, what? What are you talking about? Well, you know, remember, Lord, I, I, you know that thing I did back... I don't know what you're talking about. What are you talking about? Because God has forgotten it already, you see. He's forgotten it. It's behind, you know, in the book of Isaiah, it talks about, it actually says God will take our sins and throw them behind his back. Throws them behind his back and moves on. You know, there are some people who won't do that. They won't let you forget what you've done. But Jesus forgives and he puts it behind and he doesn't dwell on it. And he doesn't ever throw it back up in your face. That's the kind of God that we serve. He wraps his arms of love around us. He takes us in and our brokenness and our sin and our, our, our selfishness and he forgives. That's right. He forgives us. He invites us tonight. Come to me. Come to me. Come and I will forgive you. I want to give you eternal life. That's why I came to this world. That's why I died on the cross. Come to me now. Don't hesitate. Don't put it off. You know, there's no better time than the present to give your life to Christ. It never becomes easier than now. Jesus is inviting us. To 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24, who himself bore our sins. That's right, your sins and mine in his own body on the tree. That we, having died to sins, might live for righteousness by whose stripes you were healed. Would you like to have a new start tonight? Would you like to have a clean start, a nice clean slate with your sins washed away? Would you like to be able to put the past behind you and move on with victory and hope and joy and assurance? You can do it as sure as I'm standing here tonight. I promise you, Christ will never turn you away. He offers you a nice, fresh start tonight. What a God. What a magnificent God. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, he's talking about the door of our hearts. The door of our hearts. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. You know, when you sit down and you have a meal with somebody, that denotes intimacy. Right? I mean, families gather around tables or people make a, you know, a, reservations at a restaurant, a, a young man meets a, a young girl and he's attracted and he invites her out. It's an intimate, you know, you know, and Christ wants to sit down and, in an intimate setting with you. He wants to enter. Now, he wants to come into your heart. 
He wants to come into your mind. He wants to give you hope. He wants to give you life. Some people talk, uh, they say, well, the, the way you're making it sound, it sounds kind of, you know, that's like cheap grace. Listen, the sacrifice of Jesus was expensive. It cost him his life. It cost him his blood. The Bible says you have not been bought with corruptible things like gold and silver, but with the precious blood of Jesus the Lamb. No one will ever be able to shake their fist into the face of God and say, you could have done more for me. You could have done more to save me. No one will ever be able to do that because what I ask you, what more could God do than to give his own son to die for us? If, if someone had a, you know, to give up their child, I mean, if someone asked me to give up my son, my only son, or one of my daughters for some dreadful, horrible, vicious sinner, I could not do it. I could not. But that's what God did. He did it for me. He did it for you. He did it for all. Because that's the kind of God that we serve. And remember I told you, not only does this cross give you forgiveness, it gives you power. Why? Because God says he'll give us a new heart. He'll perform heart surgery. He'll take out these hearts of stone and hearts of sin. He says, I'll give you a new heart. I'll put a new spirit within you. You will be changed. You'll be different. I'll give you the mind of Christ. You'll think like Christ. We want to be like Christ. We want to, to have his mind and his spirit and his heart. The Bible says here, now by this we know that we know him if we keep his commandments. You know, when I was a young teenager and I, I went to a church one time and there was a young guy not much older than me and he was sharing his testimony. I'll never... I, I will never forget this. He stood up there and he said, you know, since I accepted Jesus, the things that I once hated, I now love. And the things that I, the things that I once loved, I now hate. What he meant by that was, you know, before Christ, there were so many things in the world that I really loved. They seemed so appealing to me and I, I wanted the, but then when I accepted Christ, those things didn't mean anything to me anymore. And before I, was, before I gave my life to Christ, all this you know, religion and the Bible and going to church, I hated that. I didn't even have any, any interest in that at all. But now that I've accepted Christ, I love to pray, and I love to read my Bible, and I love to keep the commandments. You know, for a non-believer, the commandments of God seem crazy. They seem restrictive and unreasonable. It's like, it's like dragging around a ball and chain. But when someone accepts Christ, they delight in obeying him. It makes sense, doesn't it? The law of God makes sense, and we, we want to do the things that please the one who gave so much for us, and say we say, Lord, help us. The true Christian doesn't ask, how little can I do and get by and make it into heaven? The true Christian says, Lord, I'll do anything you want me to do. I'll go anywhere you want. I'll say anything, do anything. Just show me what you want me to do. First John chapter 2, verse 3 and 4. He who says, I know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. That's, now, I didn't say that. Those are strong words, I know. But all that's really saying is that when someone truly loves Jesus, he's going to make a change. He's going to change them and they're going to, they're going to delight in following him and doing the things that he asks them to do. This is the essence of Christian faith. Faith leads to obedience. A friendship with Jesus leads to obedience. Now, listen. Keeping the commandments is not what saves us. We're going to talk more about this on another night. We're going to spend one whole night talking about the commandments. Obedience is never a means of salvation. It is a fruit of salvation. Like one of my favorite preachers says, an orange tree does not produce oranges in order to become an orange tree. An orange tree produces oranges because it is an orange tree. And Christians do not do good deeds in order to become Christians. They obey not in order to become Christians, but because they are Christians. You see. It's a fruit of salvation. Many years ago, there was a story written. Uh, it was about a young man that was condemned to die. His name was Charles. He had a wife and he had a daughter. His crime was that he belonged to an aristocratic family. And for that, during the French Revolution, he was sentenced to the, the guillotine, the guillotine. There was no hope. For appeal, there was no hope for a chance of pardon for this man. 
But then entered the picture another young man. His name was Sidney. In the story, Sidney wasn't much to look at. He didn't have a wife and a family. He didn't have much of a life at all, actually. But he did really care about his friend Charles, and he cared about his wife and his small children. And so through some careful planning, he managed to sneak into the cell, the jail cell where Charles was, and help Charles escape so that no one would know the difference. And it worked. And amid the, the mobs and the hysteria of the French Revolution and all the death that took place, no one recognized that there was a switch had taken place. And as the mob was carrying Sidney off to be executed, they thought it was Charles. They hurled insults at him. They didn't know that it was not Charles, but a different man. And yet it was. And there, when this man was put to death, they thought they were putting Charles to death. But in fact, it was Sidney. And Charles had been taken away. He had escaped and was safe with his wife and his family. It was the life of Sidney that they took. Sidney cared so much for his friend Charles and his wife and his daughter that he allowed himself to be sacrificed so that Charles could live. And of course, that's what Christ has done for us. Christ tells us in the scriptures the wages of sin is death. The death penalty hangs over each one of us. But the good news is that Jesus came and he took our place. And he invites us to accept that gift tonight. When you came in tonight, you should have received little, this little card, what happened at the cross. I want you to take that out and look at it now. Is there anyone that doesn't have this card? Anyone here that does not have this card? Raise your hand. The ushers have these cards. I want you to read through it with me. What happened at the cross? I want you to look, read through this with me, and I want you to check off any box that you think would, that you feel impressed to, to check off. Number one, as you reflect on the sacrifice of Christ, I want to thank God from the bottom of my heart for his wonderful gift of love. Now, I would think every single person would check that one off. I want to thank God from the bottom of my heart for his wonderful gift of love. If that's your desire tonight, would you check that first box? The second one says, I want to accept Jesus as my Savior from all of my sins today. Now, I recognize that many of you, if not most of you, have already accepted Jesus as your Savior, so maybe this one may not apply to you. But if you want to accept Jesus tonight as your Savior, and if you want to recommit your life to him. Maybe you've accepted him already. You want to recommit your life. Feel free to check that as well. And then finally, I want to surrender my life to him so that he can live in me through his spirit. I want to surrender my life to him so that he can live in me through his spirit. If that's your desire, check that box. Write your name on there. If you have any special prayer requests or concerns, write them on the back and we'll remember you in prayer. What I want you to do is as you depart tonight after we have our closing prayer, the ushers are going to be standing at all three exits here, and they're going to have baskets. I'm not going to ask you to turn this in now, but when you walk out, just drop your card in one of those baskets that they have, and we'll be praying for each one of you, okay? I'm thankful tonight for what happened at the cross, aren't you? I'm thankful tonight that Jesus loved us so much. He was willing to go to the cross to pay the penalty for our transgressions. And because Jesus was willing to do that, we can have forgiveness, and we can have hope, and we can have assurance that when he comes again, we'll live with him forever. If you would like to say to Jesus, I want to thank you, Lord, for what you did at the cross for me, would you stand as we close with prayer? Father in heaven, I want to thank you for the cross, the cross of Christ, the sacrifice that heaven made that we might be forgiven for our sins, that we might have victory in our lives and that we might have hope beyond this world to live with you forever. I pray for each person in this room tonight. I pray that no one will leave this building tonight without the certainty in their minds that they have chosen to accept Jesus as their Savior. I pray that as each one leaves tonight, and they go back to the quietness of their homes, 
as they lie upon their beds to fall asleep tonight. May their thoughts as they fall asleep be of Jesus and his wonderful love for them, and may it fill their hearts with peace. And when they wake up tomorrow morning, may their first thoughts be of the wonderful Jesus who loves them and has given his all for them. This is my prayer tonight. In Jesus' name and for his sake, amen. Now remember, tomorrow night we do not meet, but we'll be back again on Friday, and our subject is rescue. We're going to talk about the second coming of Jesus. For anyone who would like this book, Steps to Jesus, we have some copies out there. Just let the greeters know, and you'll get one. God bless you. Have a good night. I'll see you on what night? Friday at 7 o'clock.